<laughs> Before we begin, let us say a, a little Hail Mary for Susan, who really got all of this started. And uh, I think she's looking down at us now and thinking to herself, this is what I gave all that time for? <laughs> that character? <laughs> at any rate, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Now, um, everybody should have received one of these little prayer cards, but if you didn't, I have more over here, and um, our friend Mark will pass to give them to you if you raise your hand. And the reason I put these out, they're Blessed Carlo Acutis. Uh, he was a 14-year-old boy who, uh, he died of leukemia at 14, um, but he, he was a genius. <coughs> he, he was... Um, not only a genius, but he was very faith-filled. And he had a great love for the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, you know, to think of a 14-year-old boy saying things like, the more often we receive the Eucharist, the more we become like Jesus, and the more we get a foretaste of heaven. Imagine a 14-year-old boy saying things like that. He did something, however, that has a great deal to do with what I'm going to talk about today. He put together a website on the miracles of the Blessed Sacrament, which is still in existence today. You can, you can still look it up. And um, from that website that he put together, um, a book was, was printed. This is the book. You may want to look it up. And uh, I'm sure you can find it on Amazon. It's an excellent book. And it lists a number of, a, a great number of Eucharistic miracles throughout the world. And um, also, if you want to um, harass your pastor, there is an exhibit that comes with this book. They will come and set it up in your hall here of Eucharistic miracles. They already did it here. You've had it here? Yeah, we had it. Good for you. So you see, you've had a, a, a Blessed Carlos already in your midst. That was his work. His work. So imagine a 14-year-old boy with that faith and that intelligence and uh, the wonderful things that he did. If you, uh, he's buried in Assisi, uh, Italy, and uh, his body is incorrupt. And if you look him up on the internet, you'll, you'll see uh, uh, him. And one of the things that he said always impresses me. He said, our aim is to be the infinite and not the finite. The infinite is our homeland. We have always been expected in heaven. Wow, what a wonderful thought that is. We've always been expected in heaven. They're waiting for us in heaven. Now, today we're going to talk about miracles of the Eucharist. But first of all, we have to understand something. The miracle of the Eucharist is something that is with us always. You and I participate in the miracle of the Eucharist every time we go to Mass. That's something that a lot of people don't realize today, sadly, but it is a fact that when we go to Mass, we are attending a miracle that has been echoed from the time of Jesus to the present in every Roman Catholic Church in the world. An amazing miracle. Jesus himself said, in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, that I will give you my flesh as food. My flesh is real food, he says. My blood is real drink. It is true food and true drink. When the Jews heard this, even the apostles, they were shocked. And of course they were shocked because it was a, a shocking thing. It sounded like cannibalism. What is he talking about? And Jesus himself even said, does this shock you? <clears throat> and everybody said, yes, it does. <laughs> and so he said, uh, are you going to leave me too? And St. Peter, 
fortunately, had the presence of mind to say, no, Lord, because you have the words of life. And so he stayed, and the apostles stayed. And then at the Last Supper, he fulfilled that prophecy. He took the bread, this is my body, this is my blood. Now you'll notice several things about that. Jesus is taking real food, visible food and visible drink, and he is saying, this is my body. He's not making it, this is as if it were my body. He's not saying, this is a symbol of my body. He's saying, this is my body. The apostles took him at his word. The early church took him at his word. The Roman Catholic Church always took him at his word. This is an amazing fact that from the time of Jesus and the apostles to the present day, only the Roman Catholic Church has stood with Jesus, has accepted Jesus 100%. I always get a charge when <clears throat> some of these evangelical Christians or these so-called Bible-believing Christians say that they are following Jesus. Well, they're not, because Jesus said, I am going to give you my body and my blood as real food and real drink. And they don't accept that. They don't believe that. I have a little form that uh, somebody's going to pass out at the end of my talk about the Jehovah Witnesses. Why, uh, why am I doing that? Because every time they came to see me, I would try to give them information about the Eucharist. And it came to the point where they refused to come anymore. <laughs> and I gave information to that effect to a lot of my parishioners. And finally, it turned out that the headquarters had told the people who go door to door, not to take anything from those Catholics anymore. <laughs> and if they start to talk about what we're talking about today, they were to leave immediately. They weren't to listen. Because they are denying the Bible. And I'm afraid that most Protestants deny the Bible when it comes to this fact. I am going to give you my body and blood as food and drink. My real body, my real food, my real drink, true drink, true food. I can't say that enough because that's what Jesus said. And that's something that today even we ignore. That's something that even today Catholics don't quite get. This miracle of bread becoming a supernatural, miraculous food that gives eternal life is an amazing fact. And it is something that you and I have available to us very easily. We have a problem though. We don't take it seriously. And we don't teach it seriously. And we don't accept it seriously. Think for a moment what is happening here. When we come to Mass, Jesus Christ himself is physically, miraculously, supernaturally, in reality, present. Jesus is there. He is with us. He is there. God Almighty is in the church above us. We have to think about that more often. And when we come to communion, when we receive communion, we have to do it in a way that stresses the fact that we believe that we are being united with God, that we are becoming one with God, that we are becoming His total creation with Him. That's an amazing fact of the Catholic Church. And if we don't appreciate that, we're missing everything. We have nothing. The fact that Jesus Christ is in this church above us in the tabernacle and the fact that he 
is going to come into our hearts, that he is going to be one with us, that he is going to accompany us always, physically, as well as spiritually, miraculously, and supernaturally. Wow. We have to teach that lesson, that miracle of the Eucharist, we have to teach that lesson more fervently, more excitedly, more thoroughly. Well, how are you going to do that? That's the, the job of the priest from the pulpit. No, it's our job too. Every one of us has to preach what we believe. How do we do that? Let me tell you something. Oftentimes, actions speak far more uh, aggressively than words. Father can get up in the pulpit and give you verse and scripture and facts and, and, and information and it'll be wonderful and we may be um, uh, informed and impressed with all of that. Good. But you and I can also do something. We can preach by our actions. People sometimes forget that the things that we do and the way that we do them can make a very strong fact, a, a very strong point. For instance, if I go up to communion, ta -da 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 -da, and I'm talking to you, and hey, look at there, you got, oh, and then I stick out my hand and I grab the host from the priest and I pluck it into my mouth. What is the message that that's giving? What message is that giving to me, and what message is it giving to those people around me? It is saying that I am doing something ordinary. It is saying that I'm doing something that doesn't matter. It is saying that this act of receiving is minor compared to my high-fiving everybody along the way uh, to the altar. On the other hand, if I come up to the altar, and if there's an altar rail, if I kneel there devoutly, and I recollect myself thinking, Jesus is coming to me, Jesus is going to be with me any moment now, and then the priest comes, and rather than grasping at the host, I allow the host to come to me on my tongue. What have I said? I have said to myself, I am receiving God. God is coming to me. And I'm saying this to everybody who's watching me. They're seeing, wow, that young man, that young lady, that old lady, <laughs> that old man, they really believe. There is something special there. There is something unique there. I have a huge problem with people who walk up to the altar and reach out their hand for Holy Communion. That was never approved by the church. The only reason we have it in the United States today is because one of the cardinals, whose name I won't mention, lied to the Pope and told Pope Paul VI that the people of America are doing this and they want to do it. That wasn't true. And Pope Paul, to keep the peace, said, <coughs> I will give you a permission, but the real proper way is to receive communion in the traditional way, kneeling and on the tongue. Unfortunately, the devil had his way. And many people receive by reaching out and grasping as if they were in a line at McDonald's. Not even that kind, not even that respectful. So, my suggestion to you all is, <clears throat> if you receive on the hand, stop it. Stop it right now. Receive in the proper way. Hi, Father. Um, I, I do have to bring this up because I w we were taught by Monsignor Dan, uh, who just died, as you know, that uh, as, as part of our teaching of Vatican II, 
that if you hold out your hand like the cradle of Christ respectfully, and the priest places it on it, and then you take it and bring it to your mouth, it's it's a symbolic of the priest giving it to you, but then you using your fiat and saying, I accept you, Lord, come into my mouth. And it's 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 like an action of prayer. And so I do not think that it is, I, I do think it was God who helped teach that lesson. First of all, that was not taught by Vatican II. Well, it was taught to me by the senior Dan, and it was part of an accepted way that Vatican II allowed people to do it. No, Vatican II had nothing to do with it. It's interesting that many people will point to all of the things uh, that we are doing today and say, well, Vatican II taught that. No, it did not come from Vatican II. It came from a cardinal in the United States requesting this permission because he claimed that it was already being done and it is what okay. the American people okay. wanted. But the cardinal was an apostle. Pardon? The cardinal was an apostle. And, and he basically said that to us. And, and God said, those, um, whatever you say in my name will be granted, and whoever you say bound in my name will be bound. And he, the cardinal, was the apostle, as the same level as the pope, basically, for our, our America. And the cardinal is an apostle only if he tells the truth. I, 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 I'm sorry, Father, I'm going to have to disagree with you on that. I'm sorry. You're it's a free country. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I believe that when I accept the fruit in my hand, it's a prayer. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing it two ways. I'm accepting Jesus myself, say, my fiat. I accept your will, Lord. I accept you in my mouth, in my, in my heart, in my soul. That's lovely. And I hope that but you I, could... But I, 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 that you really, it's, I think, I, I, I really, am, I'm sorry, Father. I don't think you're telling the truth at this point. Because, uh, because, 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 because the Cardinal was an apostle. The, father, the Cardinal was an apostle. Father Charles, can I say something? Yes. 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 I'm just going to say something. Thank you. Well, just a little bit more background. I know that people, of course, can receive Holy Communion in the hand very reverently. But the fact of the matter is, that the custom of communion in the hand began in Holland, and it was a grave abuse. Finally, it came to the attention of Paul VI, but the Dutch church to this day is extremely liberal. In the 70s, the Dutch church had the famous Dutch catechism, which was total apostasy, and the faith was lost there. So Paul VI had petitioned all the bishops in the world, asking them whether or not it was their thinking that it would be a good notion to introduce the custom of communion in the hand. And overwhelmingly, it seems to me that 90% of the bishops had said no. So Paul VI, to accommodate this touchy situation, allowed an indult, saying that in those countries where the custom was already in place, permission would be granted. So this is a tactic of the liberals many times. I'm not saying Paul VI was liberal, but the agitators. They get something in place, and then they get the church to approve what they've been doing disobediently. So Paul VI said, in those countries where this custom has been illicitly introduced, permission can be granted by the bishops making this request. So in the United States, Father was too delicate to mention the name. Cardinal Bernardin was a famous cardinal who was alleged to be a Satanist, who was an avowed homosexual, who requested that the Chicago gay chorus be at his funeral, agitated in the United States to get communion in the hand approved by the bishops. This took place in 1977. And Cardinal Bernardin was very dishonest in the manner by which he achieved this objective. And he repeatedly returned with the, the, uh, the question bringing it up over and over again. He used dishonest tactics and finally the bishop succumbed and in 1977 the custom was introduced. We see that in many, many, many places we've heard m multiple reports of abuses of the Blessed Sacrament by hosts being left in the um, benches of the parishes, people coming in not knowing what to do with the host. They, come up uh, with a friend perhaps and they haven't been properly informed or instructed. So there's no doubt 
that being able to receive communion in the hand has resulted in many, many, many abuses because the sacrament is more readily available for profanation. Now, I am not saying, as Father Charles would not intend also, that people who receive in the hand have these objectives in mind. No, that's not what is being said. But rather that, it is easier to obtain a host in this method because the rule requires that the person is supposed to put one hand on the other, uh, step aside, and then immediately consume the Blessed Sacrament. But you've all seen many times people taking the host, they walk back to their seat. I, as a priest, had to follow on various occasions people to the end of the of the church. I remember on one occasion I finally caught up with the man in the vestibule and he had the host in his hand. I don't think he necessarily had any malicious intention. Some people these days can be a little unstable, a little confused and so forth. But there's no doubt this custom has made it possible for this kind of behavior to be more frequently occurring. So we might see people such as Bishop Athanasius Snyder who wrote a book <coughs> Uh, this is the Lord, where he encourages the, the custom of returning to receiving on the tongue. I know that a lot of people who receive on the hand do it because it's in their mind a, a sense of reverence. They have the ability to touch the host. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing in that regard. But St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that only consecrated hands should touch the host. And the priest at his ordination has his hands consecrated for the sake of being able to have that privilege. So we see that there are many, 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 many aspects that impact on this question. But the thing is, Father Charles is right in what he said. And a lot of, and if it's another issue was brought up inadvertently in this discussion, today we have this mentality that the episcopacy is on equal footing with a validly elected pope, whereas the pope is the supreme head. And so during the time of Paul VI, when this decision was made, no particular cardinal had the same authority as did uh, Pope Paul VI. But those were tumultuous times too. So a can of worm has, worms has been opened, and here's the thing, here's the thing. Those clergy members who are responsible for the introduction of communion on the hand were people who had little love for the church, little love for Christ, little love for the Blessed Sacrament. Martin Luther had introduced the custom as a means of denigrating belief, or at least Martin Luther's immediate confers. Their intention was to eliminate that false notion, false in their mind, that the Blessed Sacrament was God. And so that was a way of over-familiarizing the faithful and thus having this as a possibility. Also, we have this old thing going back to the early church. It is claimed by some that communion and the hand was the norm in the early church, but there are those who propose that a custom in Eastern hospitality was for the host to place the first morsel of food on the tongue of the guest. And so it's not at all unlikely that Christ himself might have placed the host on the tongue of the apostles. We don't know. But in those cases where communion on the hand was uh, allowed, there were great, great cautions that were presented. A friend of ours, Father Edward Young, who's a Ukrainian Catholic priest, told us that also the, the hand would have to be washed. So the person would come, receive, and then afterwards the hand had to be purified because of the particles. Someone's done a study showing how many particles fall off the host when they are in the hand. Now in America, I notice our hosts are, are more stable, but in Portugal, where I was for a lot of time, the hosts there are constructed differently and the particles are all over the place. So these big affairs, there was a famous uh, video shown of one of those great uh, outdoor masses, great when I mean a lot of people attended, and people were literally passing the host from one person to the other. So we see that this is a problem. So one thing leads to another because the custom never was that it was necessary to receive Holy Communion every time you attended Mass. People would make a great preparation, a great expectation. This is a great event taking place and so there was a long fasting period and so forth. So when they go to those big outdoor Masses, 
my personal opinion is it shouldn't be uh, provided for thousands of people because it offers an opportunity for profanation of the Blessed Sacrament. At the World Youth Day in Lisbon last July, they showed a picture of the quote-unquote tabernacle. They were big um, plastic storage boxes, and the posts were stored in there. It was a degradation for sure. So anyway, I'm very sorry to take up so much time, but well, the thing uh, is... I would like to apologize. I do believe you were telling the truth. That was my, my fault. I was wrong in saying that, and, um, and I do apologize. Um, but I am still not resolved, because this is an official teaching in the United States that it is okay to take it by the hand. Um, I, I, it, but my I, father I, was saying not, this. It I is allowed, yeah. but it still is on the books that the norm yes, is on the top. Okay. But, and I thank you so much for clarifying and, that, and I, and I truly do apologize. <coughs> and, and now I have the privilege of saying, I accept. <laughs> now, you know, just as a side note, during the um, pandemic, so-called, people were told not to receive on the tongue because there was danger of touching. And I noticed something very interesting when I was giving out communion during the pandemic. There was always a group of people that came and received on the tongue anyways, which was fine. But every person who received in the hand, I had to touch them. You cannot simply drop the host into the hand. You place the host on the hand, and so you touch them. I touched everyone in church. <laughs> but when they came for communion on the tongue, I didn't touch them. I placed the, the, the host on the tongue without touching them. So it, it was very interesting that they were pushing that at that point when really they were causing more problems than they should have. Now, the reason I had brought that up was because since the 1970s, there has been a great upswing in the number of miracles of uh, the Eucharist. Isn't that strange? Since the early 70s, the late 60s, there was a great um, increase of miracles of the host. And what happens is, it seems, that hosts, the communion hosts, have been found on the floor, in a hymnal, in the pew, or someone has walked off with it in some way and attempted to do something terrible with it. <coughs> That's the point where, the, the point I was trying to make is with the communion in the hand, that became something that was very much uh, done, very easily done. In fact, when I uh, was in the parish, I had my altar boys trained, they would be with me with the patent, and they were told, I told them, keep an eye on the people, if you see somebody take communion in the hand, make sure they consume the host. And a number of times, the boy would say, Father, that man. I said, go get him. <laughs> go get him. And they would follow the man and stop him and st stand there until the man consumed the host. It, it really has become a, a, a serious problem. But as I started to say, uh, because of all of these hosts that have been found, even at my seminary, by the way, they would find hosts on occasion in the hymnals on Sundays when the lay people, the neighborhood people would come in to, the ch to our chapel and they would attend Mass. I think they were there only because of the singing uh, and the, the music. We, were, it was, we had a wonderful choir. And the next day we would find hosts in the hymnals. People didn't know what to do, you know. So it is a danger. Well, as I started to say, because of that, there have been a number of great miracles uh, of uh, hosts being found, and they, something very strange happens. If I find a host on the floor, I am to take that host and put it in what is called an ablution cup. An ablution cup is a little cup of water that is kept by the tabernacle. And the purpose is to put it in there so that it will uh, disintegrate and then it can be disposed of without causing sacrilege or dishonor to God. All right? And so this is something that is done simply because 
it would be unsanitary to do anything else. Um, and so oftentimes it is simply placed in that cup. The cup is placed in the tabernacle and when the host disintegrates, then the water can be uh, disposed of properly. However, it seems that since the 1970s, the early, late 60s, the 1970s, there have been more instances of miracles with those hosts. And um, in most cases, in, in the, um, um, there's a case in, in, in the, uh, Tixtila, Mexico, a case in Sokolka, Poland, and a case in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and uh, several, uh, I won't even go through the list of names, but there are so many of them right here in the United States, where the host has been placed in the um, ablution cup, and in a few days they come back and find that it's blood and flesh. And they oftentimes will take these samples to a doctor who has no idea what they have, and he will examine it, and they will find something similar in each case. Here's what they have found. In each case where they have seen the host turn to blood and flesh, that's exactly what it is. The host has somehow miraculously turned into flesh and blood. The flesh, strangely enough, is always a heart muscle. A heart muscle. And the blood is always fresh. And the blood is always a particular type, AB, <coughs> which is a fairly rare form of a, a blood type. And interestingly enough, all of these miracles have the same blood type. This even from miracles that go back to the Middle Ages where they had no idea about blood types. And yet each one of these miracles have the same blood type the same AB blood type, which is a fairly rare blood type, and that is the same blood type that is found on the Shroud of Turin. So that's something amazingly interesting. But I want to go back a bit, because there have been some other rather spectacular and unusual miracles. One of the uh, best known miracles is that of Saint Anthony. There are others that, that don't involve uh, blood and flesh and so on. And the case of Saint Anthony, uh, who was having a uh, debate with a heretic about the nature of the Eucharist. Saint Anthony, of course, was saying, the Bible says, Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. This is reality. The heretic was saying, no, it's only a symbol. And finally, after a long period of arguing, the heretic says, I will make a deal with you. If my mule will recognize Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament and bow before that, I will believe, I will become a Catholic. <coughs> So Anthony, of course, had to accept, and he did. And so the mule was taken and locked in the barn without any food. And so they brought, after the third day, St. Anthony came with the monstrance, with the host, and he stood at one end of the square. The man came with a bundle of food for the donkey, for, for the mule, uh, hay and whatever else mules like to eat. Um, and he brought that and piled it up on the other side of the square. And then they brought the donkey in. The donkey looks and he sees the food over there. And he sees St. Anthony over there. And it's very strange because the donkey is going back and forth like this. And finally, he runs to Anthony and falls on his knees. Imagine a donkey kneeling, bowing before the Blessed Sacrament. St. Anthony blessed the mule and sent him to his 
to his dinner. So that was one, one of the great miracles of, of St. Anthony. In Kraków, in Poland, in 1345, a thief broke into a church and broke into the tabernacle with the intention of taking the ciborium, which he presumed was gold. When he got the ciborium, he found that it was not gold, but brass. Highly polished, it looked very beautiful, but it was just brass, it was not gold. And it was filled with hosts, consecrated hosts. He took the, 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 uh, the uh, um, ciborium with the hosts in anger and threw it into the swamp. Mm. The swamp turned out to be the place where the garbage was always empty. The next um, morning, one of the um, farmers going by noticed light coming from the swamp, sparks of light, which was very unusual at any time. And he called a few of his friends. They saw the thing too, sparks of light coming. And the more people came and gathered, they saw these shots of light coming from the swamp. And finally, the priest was called. And he saw what was going on, and being a very bold young man, uh, he lifted up his cassock and waded into the swamp and found the, the uh, ciborium there with the hosts in it. And they took it back in procession uh, to the church. But the next day, the host, the, 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 um, the um, ciborium was gone, and they found it in the swamp again with lights coming from it. They did this three times, and three times the, the, uh, the suburb was back in the swamp. Sometimes they're a little slow in getting the message. It seems that our Lord wanted a church of reparation built on that spot in the swamp, which they did. And if you go to Krakow today, the church of, the, of Corpus Christi, is the church that was built over the site of that miracle, and those hosts are preserved in the tabernacle uh, over that uh, altar. In Avignon, France, in 1433, um, there was a, um, a period of um, a great deal of rain, and uh, it looked like there was going to be flooding, and so the monks at a particular church put the Blessed Sacrament on the altar in the hope of praying for protection. And they put the, put the uh, monstrance on the altar and because uh, something was going on, the, 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 the flood water started to come, the, the uh, few people that were there ran out of the church to see what was happening and as they ran out of the church, the flood waters came and filled the area where the church was completely. We've got to go and rescue the Blessed Sacrament. So they got into a boat and they went across the area that was flooded with water. They came to the door of the church and then they found something very unusual. The, the church interior was filled with water except for the center aisle. It was like Moses parting the sea. There was a wall of water on either side going right up to the altar and it was perfectly dry. It was an amazing miracle of the Eucharist and they called, more people came to see this wonder so it was witnessed by a few hundred people and they were able to take the monstrance dry, walk down the church aisle with it and then into the boats and rescue the Blessed Sacrament. It's interesting to note that many of these miracles involved um, a, uh, a, a number of uh, um, a number of people uh, seeing these things. Uh, it wasn't something that was was um, just um, one person that saw it. it wasn't a, a singular miracle. It was a miracle that involved many people witnessing it. One of the great miracles is the miracle of uh, Lanciano. That took place in 750 A.D. 750 A.D. And here's what happened. The priest was saying Mass, and he was going through a bad period. 
his faith was weak. And as he was saying the Mass, he, he consecrated the Blessed Sacrament. This is my body, this is my blood. And then he stopped. And he said, is this true? Is this a fact? Can this be? And he doubted very seriously. And he just stood there, <clears throat> dumbfounded by his negative thoughts about the Blessed Sacrament. <clears throat> and then suddenly, something very strange happened. The host, the large priest's host, turned into flesh, and the wine in the um, chalice turned into actual blood. And of course, he was terrified at what had happened. The bishop came, the, uh, people saw this host of flesh, they saw the chalice filled with blood. Now, here's what's very interesting about all of that. That host and that blood was preserved in a reliquary. If you go to the um, Lanciano today, you will see a very interesting reliquary. There is a crystal chalice with the dried lumps of blood and a monstrance with the host in it. In 1970, the bishop decided to do something unusual. He asked the Pope if he could have that relic investigated by scientists and doctors. The Pope gave permission, and this is what they found. Now, mind you, this happened in 750 AD, 750. They found that the host was actually the heart muscle. They found that it was cut in such a way that even today, even in the 1970s, it would take extreme uh, skill to be able to cut that kind of uh, flesh off of a heart muscle, off of the heart. <clears throat> You would have to have extreme instruments, which were certainly not available in 750, and not that readily available even in 1970, to be able to do this. They found that the flesh of the heart was not decomposing. They found that the flesh of the heart of that host exhibited um, signs, scientific signs of being taken under um, great uh, um, suffering. In other words, that the individual that that heart muscle came from was enduring extreme uh, uh, torture. The blood showed all of those same qualities also. Uh, again, remember I said the same blood type, AB. The same blood type of the of the, um, the Shroud of Turin, and the same blood type that all the other authenticated miracles take place. The same blood type, but there's something very odd that the scientists cannot explain at all about the blood. It's in five little um, lumps of blood, dried blood, and they found that when they weighed one, it was the same weight as all five. There's no reason for that. <laughs> Why is that? One of them weighs a few ounces. They all weigh a few ounces, the same number. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure what the, what the exact weight is, but let's say it's, let's say it's a half ounce for one piece of, uh, of, of that dried blood. All five pieces together weigh that same uh, amount. What a strange thing. So the thing is that the, the scientists have proved that something very uh, unusual, out of the ordinary, supernatural has happened here. This is not simply um, a piece of flesh and some dried blood. It is unique in so many, many ways. Now, just one last uh, example. Um, when. Uh, Francis, Pope Francis was the bishop in Argentina. Um, they found a host discarded. 
They did the same thing as I told you. They placed it in the ablution cup, placed it in the, um, in the tabernacle, and <clears throat> a few days later, when they went to dispose of it, they found that it was a, a, a piece of bloodied flesh. So again, they sent it to a, a doctor in New York, uh, of all things, and he examined it. He had no idea what it was, where it came from, but he did say that there was something very unusual about it, in that the blood was living blood. The blood exhibited signs of, of torture, and he was astounded by the fact that the blood was living blood. It wasn't simply uh, uh, somebody had dropped some blood into the, uh, into the water and left it there for a few days. It was still living blood. And that was sent back to, uh, to Buenos Aires, to Argentina, and uh, with that explanation, the doctor had no idea what it was and why this unusual thing was sent to him. And he was curious to know how is it that they received this piece of flesh which was from the heart and this blood that was still uh, living blood uh, and that it, was, it continued to be living blood. He didn't understand it. And finally, when he received the uh, uh, information back from Buenos Aires that it was a host, he understood then. So the point of all of this is that Jesus is with us, Jesus is miraculously with us, and we have to take advantage of that, number one. We have to proclaim it, number two. We have to be sure that we are doing all we can to not only show that respect, but live that respect and understand that we are receiving Jesus Christ. We have to be careful that we don't allow custom and uh, other things to get in our way. We have to make sure that we prepare for Holy Communion. Some of you are old enough. Well, some of you are more than old enough. <laughs> and you can remember that when we were much younger, that you would go to confession on Saturday afternoon, and then you, if you were brought up properly, you made sure that the rest of the day was spent quietly, not doing anything that would get you into any kind of a, uh, difficulty, but re reflecting on what was going to happen. And then the next morning, you received Holy Communion with exceeding reverence, with exaggerated reverence even, because this was something unique, something special. What was unique? It was Jesus Christ, living and true. And you only received him maybe once or twice a year because it took so much to do. Today, we have been given the opportunity to receive Jesus on a daily basis. I can remember when I was a child that even the nuns had to have permission to receive communion every day. It was not something that was acceptable. Why? Because they had to prepare, they had to be aware, they had to come to the Eucharist totally, 100% focused on Jesus Christ. And so the spiritual directors, the confessors, rarely gave permission even to the nuns. So if you receive communion in the old days, once a month, you were really doing very uh, unusual, something very unusual. Once a month was not, not the norm. Once a year was the norm. Is that interesting? Now, because of St. Pius X, we have that opportunity to receive communion younger and to receive communion more often. That means then that you and I have to be more and more and more aware of what we are doing and we have to be more even exaggerated in our reverence not only for ourselves to increase our faith, to increase our acknowledgement that this is Jesus Christ, but to proclaim that to everybody around us. To receive casually, to receive second-handedly, just, oh, that's just something, oh, yes, oh, here he is. Uh, no, 
it has to be done something that takes time. So, my advice is this. If you haven't been to confession within a month, you better go. I recommend confession at least twice a month. At least twice a month. If you go less than that, you're in big trouble. I cannot believe that any of us here can be that ready to receive Jesus unless we've been to confession frequently. And I say at least twice a month. When we receive communion in the church, we have to make sure that we are focusing on what is going to happen. So if you belong to a parish, God forbid, where they are talking and socializing before and after Mass, find a better parish. Something is wrong with that parish. If they are conversing after Mass in the church, before and after Mass, these are people that do not believe. If you can't go to another church, then set an example and remind people around you, please, I'd like to pray. Please, Jesus is here. This is not right. We have to make that exaggerated reverence to teach other people what is going on here. And when people behave that way in church, obviously they do not have total faith. They have a very light faith, and they're going to fall away. So, if we're going to go to communion, we go to confession at least twice a month, we prepare ourselves, and certainly in the church before Mass, praying and making ourselves ready, and then as we walk down the aisle even, focusing on the fact I am about to see and receive and be with Jesus Christ himself. And then uh, if you are fortunate enough to have an altar rail to kneel there, you have a time to prepare as the priest comes to you. Or if you're in line, you have to make sure that you are focusing on that fact of Jesus Christ coming to you, to being with Jesus Christ 100%. And then when you go back to your place to make sure that you take advantage of the fact that you are now having a personal and private audience with God Almighty. Just think of that. If I wanted to have an audience with the Pope, or if I wanted to have an audience with the President of the United States, I'd have to, number one, get nicely dressed up. <laughs> number two, fat chance. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I, they're not going to want to see me. Who am I? I'm not going to get into the Vatican. I'm not going to get into the White House. But here, God Almighty is waiting for us, and He will receive us, and He will have an audience with us. We can tell Him everything and anything we need to do. And it's one-on-one. -on -one. What an amazing thing. To be with God one-on-one. -on -one. All right? Now, all of this business about receiving in the hand or on the tongue or the like, the point is we have to do everything we can to make sure that we are proclaiming the fact that this is not ordinary time. This is not ordinary food. This is not an ordinary event. This is a unique thing that is approached differently, reverently, supernaturally, because we are having our time one-on-one -on -one with Jesus Christ. That's a very difficult thing today. It's a very difficult thing today. I have seen, unfortunately, even the clergy treat the Blessed Sacrament very cavalierly, very casually. And I'm sorry to say that that sermon is far more powerful than any poetic, beautiful words that they may spout at the pulpit. Our actions speak very loudly. So, keep in mind, all of these wonderful miracles of the Eucharist, which have been authenticated, all of these wonderful miracles of the Eucharist, which are spectacular. If you get this book, you're going to find just 
well, a few hundred miracles, but there are thousands more of the, of the Eucharist. Uh, you're, you're going to find that uh, you know, the, the, these are wonderful, wonderful things. But we have to understand, Jesus is performing a miracle for me. He's on the altar for me. He's on the altar for you. And he comes to me, he comes to you personally. That is the great miracle. And that is what we have to pay attention to. And that is what we have to proclaim by our actions, by our words, by everything that we see and do. Jesus Christ is there. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes, Father. Um, I think I, uh, that miracle from Buenos Aires. Yes. I think what the doctor said also was that the sample of flesh had been taken from a living heart. Yes. And yes. that's what really shook him up. Yes. So that, that, that bit of the histology was not from a dead cadaver. It was yes. from a living person. Like, how did they take this piece of heart out of a living person? And secondly, um, having mercy on us, Our Lady of Medjugorje said that monthly confession could save the West. Yes. And we used to have first Saturday devotions. Um, as a farmer's daughter, first Fridays was off the ticket. <laughs> but first Saturdays, we very often uh, kept up with that. And uh, third, Jesus isn't just in the tabernacle. Because we are gathered in his name, we have to reverently acknowledge that Jesus is in us. Yes, we're well, one we or two are, are gathered in my people. name. Yeah. 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 But but the physical reality of the Eucharist is something that we cannot deny. And it is something that is unique to the Catholic Church in that we have kept hold of it yes. from the time of Jesus to today. That is something that is amazing. Now, Mrs. Uh, LaCroix is going to pass out some of that information about the Jehovah Witnesses. And as I said before, that is the one thing that always gets them a little bit annoyed. When I, you know, when they come, they, they are so bold, and I give them credit for that. They are so bold that they come to the rectory, even. And whenever I see them at the door, I always say, Oh, you're more than welcome to come in. This could be your lucky day. <laughs> Either you will get me, or I will get you. But either way, somebody is going to benefit. Well, they come in, and after a while of sitting and talking with me, they'll say, oh, uh, we have an appointment in Greenfield now. We have to go. <laughs> so they don't usually stay very long. But uh, I, I think that the fact that we have to announce that we have Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament because Jesus Christ said it. We are Bible-believing Christians because Jesus said it. We believe what Jesus Christ told us. It's in the Bible. And he said, my blood is real drink. My flesh is real food. And that's something that we have to understand. And we have to know that when we receive... We are one with Jesus Christ, and we cannot be any closer to that. And as, uh, as young Carlos said, the more often we receive the Eucharist, the more we become like Jesus, and the more we have a uh, foretaste of heaven. One of the things that he said at one point, I always like to think, uh, what, what, a, what, a, what a beautiful thought. He says, to always be close to Jesus, that is my life's plan. We have to plan to be always close to Jesus Christ. And so when we have Holy Communion, we are definitely close to Jesus Christ. You can't get any closer. There it is. Now I'm done. <laughs> Father, we want to thank you so much. really have such a unique way of explaining so many things to us. We love you. Thank you, Father. Thank you.